Have you ever read a math formula in a deep learning textbook and could not understand the meaning? You might get the sensation in your chest that you are kind of missing a fundamental skill. Even if you take courses, watch lectures, or read a textbook, you still feel like you're missing a critical piece of the puzzle. In today's short tutorial, I will show you my framework for mastering deep learning math. This tutorial is part of a series on how to decipher even the most complicated deep learning paper. For those that are new to the channel, I'm Yassine, a published researcher and machine learning practitioner who loves to teach. If you follow the previous video, you know that the trick to read deep learning formula is to kind of slow down and clear out piecewise each of the components of a formula. However, this process can still take a long time if you aren't very familiar with like the basics of linear algebra or calculus. If we take a sneak peek at the process for mastering deep learning math, it's actually very dumb simple. I'll show you all the details in a few minutes, but we will start first with an exploration of why there is a high emphasis here on doing exercise. This process applied to any kind of math, but for deep learning math, you need to put a focus on very specific subfields. Before we get started, I would like to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is a website with lots of interactive bite-sized lessons and problem to solve, which is kind of on brand for uh, this video about a math framework focused intensely on doing exercise. One thing I liked is that it's very focused on actively doing the exercise versus reading only about the theory, which in their case, it come all packaged into one. In my view, it's kind of the most performant way of learning a new subject. I've tested mainly their calculus and algebra content and it's pretty solid. So you can check out the link brilliant.org slash deep learning with the scene to test it out for 30 days and get a 20% off the annual subscription. So my conclusion here is that to get good at math, you need to do math. So the reason I'm making this statement is because I've subjectively found it uh, through practice that it is the best way to learn. So I tried to lot of different ways uh, throughout my studies, during my undergrad, master, PhD. And the only one that I found that reliably work is to actually do the math. And here, I'm not talking about like attending classes or like watching lectures or taking very detailed notes. All that is like, frankly, optional. I'm literally saying that the only way for it to click in your head is to take the pen and then do the exercise. So let's check out what Grant from 3Blue1Brown, which has like a very popular YouTube channel for math visualization, think on the subject. Um, it will echo a bit the same exercise focus approach to math learning I'm gonna show you here. What is the best way to learn math for people who might be at the beginning of that journey? Your temptation will be to spend more time uh, like watching lectures or reading. Um, try to force yourself to do more problems than you naturally would. Uh, that's a big one. Um, like the the focus time that you're spending should be on like solving specific problems and seek entities that have well curated lists of problems. So if you can take a little look through those questions at the end of the chapter before you read the chapter, a lot of them won't make sense. Some of them might, and those are those are the best ones to think about. A lot of them won't, but just you know take a quick look and then read a little bit of the chapter and then maybe take a look again and things like that. And don't consider yourself done with the chapter until you've actually worked through a couple exercises. Okay, so assuming my subjective experience and grant one is correct, that you in fact need to do math to get good at math, why though? So why math is like that? Like why it stand out compared to other disciplines like, um, like biology, which you can master by kind of just learning the facts? This meta review paper in the psychology field called um, The Connection Between Spatial and Mathematical Ability Across Development shine some light on the matter. So there seems to be like a deep link between spatial ability and mathematical ability across a whole range of age group. So if you look over here, like they've done a bunch of uh, a meta review of different paper. Um, and here the average age was five, six, 12, 19, 21. And then they measure like math skills of different sort. One of the interesting conclusion of this paper is this one. And the, the author said, we also find evidence of strong spatial mathematical connection and transfer from spatial intervention to mathematical understanding. Spatial ability and math are related in their cognitive process in some kind of sort of way. You might stop here and wonder like, hey, I'm good in physical activity, which are spatial in nature, and I still suck at math. So the logical conclusion here, in my view, is very simple. So you aren't thinking about math or training it either in the right way. So let's take a look at two spatially related skills, like one fairly obvious, you'll see, and one a bit less so, and how to get better at them uh, to get a sense of their parallel with math. The team, the team, go team, go sports! So the first spatial related skill is obviously sport. To get good at any sport, you don't probably reach out to a textbook or a lecture or watch like tons of video about it. You actually need to, to do the sport first and foremost to get good at it. Even if you're understanding about 
why a certain set of movement works is incomplete, you can still be very solid at that particular sport. Sure, you need to have like the right muscular endurance to be able to do these movements and all that, but past that, you need to be able to focus your brain to do the movement properly. So if you were to kind of mindlessly do the movement without thinking about them correctly, you might either hurt yourself or have mediocre performance at best. Therefore, to be good at sports, you kind of need to do quality reps that engage your spatial function of your brain uh, properly, and lots of them. So this is where the mastery comes from. Six of spades. Two of hearts. Okay. Jack of spades. The second spatial related skill is surprisingly enough memorization. It's, it's a bit of a tangent here, but for mammalian and uh, human more specifically, there's a very deep connection between our spatial ability and memory. There's a very tight connection between having good ordered recall memory and spatial visualization. There's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to memorize. Let's say something complicated like um, um, the periodic table. You can do rot memorization, you can try that, where you try to name the element like one by one and then you repeat that. Or you can link the element together into like some sort of visualization that link them together in a sort of big chain. That's another one. But the more potent methodology here is um, the memory palace method. This method, which I studied uh, while I was doing a research in a psychiatry lab, leveraged one of the core aspects of the human brain, which is that you are uh, very much able to remember hundreds, if not thousands of ordered elements automatically and effortlessly. So if you were to close your eye right now, right? And think about your kitchen, right? Think about the kitchen. You, you wouldn't just like blank out and not know where the heck uh, the stuffs are and like, if there was something surprising in the kitchen, like a kangaroo, you'd be like, what, what, why is a kangaroo over there? Um, if you don't have a kangaroo. So in your mind eyes, you will be able to look around everywhere and uh, tell me exactly where everything is to varying degree of details. So the method of loss, I hijack that fact and take the random element order that you are uh, trying to learn and put them into a path of your own choosing through familiar places. So the repetition you need to do for memorization is, funny enough, not in the object you're trying to memorize per se. The objects are kind of irrelevant, they can be anything. It's in the spatial area and in the visualization you're using to encode the, the, the thing, the elements, in space that take most of your time. So the repetition, once again, need to happen thoughtfully in the spatial domain to have a mastery over this memorization ability. Here, I'm making the non-scientific argument that the reason you need to do a lot of math to get good at it is because it is very much like these other skills which requires leveraging the innate spatial power of your brain. So a bit of a detour here, but we are finally there. Um, so let me show you what my technique looked like after having like refined it throughout the years. Uh, you see, it's pretty simple. First, you need to select the right subfield of mathematics to study. So not all of them are like directly relevant and some of them might become relevant in very specific subfield of deep learning. But the broad category uh, are the following fours. So our good old calculus, followed by like linear algebra. Then you have the frequentist probability and the Bayesian type of probability. There are plenty of others, like uh, the whole field of complexity. Uh, but if you get a solid mastery of these four, there isn't anything outlandish you will encounter in deep learning. It's, it's mostly just that. Now. Within these subfield, you need to find resources that are very exercise rich. If you are aiming to actually understand the material at a deep level, you will need to do your repetition and you will need lots of them. So find a good textbook or some sort of repository of exercise with their answers. This is where something interactive like Brilliant work well, as long as they match the field you are studying, of course, and the technical level that you're at. Take all of these elements and put them into a gigantic list that you will be referring to. The method I found that worked the best to structure the repetition is what I call the green, yellow, and red method. I don't, I don't even know if it's an official name, but I call it that. So the method is very simple. You start with any of the exercise in your list. It doesn't. It really does matter which one you start with because you are going to literally drill them all multiple times. So you do each exercise while trying to do the following. You try to focus on visualizing the shape of the problem and the motion to get to the right answer. So at first, um, you aren't going to visualize much and you will feel kind of awkward and forced, just like absolutely any movement you ever attempted for the first time in your life. So once you try the exercise, look directly at the answer uh, to get feedback. So did you get the right answer? If yes, and you understand why you got it right, congratulations, you put a green on this exercise and you will never do that one again. People might disagree here, but there is no point of doing it again because you managed to go through the motion first try. 
So with more skills and understanding, this exercise will be trivial and a waste of your time and energy. So I would focus most of my time on the harder exercise. It's kind of, you're gonna see that's kind of what this method does. So if you messed it up and you understand the motion that you messed up, um, you put a yellow on this and you move on. A yellow means that you're going to come back to this one in your next pass. So if you messed it up and even with the answer next to you, you have zero idea what the heck is going on. Uh, you put the big fat red next to it and you just move on. Red means that you're going to dig a bit more in the theory and drill this exercise multiple times because there's like a critical part of the motion you do not understand. This or the shape of the problem, you, you can't see it. I like to do these paths by groups of subject. So this way, if like a whole subject is green, I'm just not going to even take a look at it anymore. I will focus on the harder problem for my understanding. So the visualization part you need to perform here is broken down into two parts. So the first part is what is the shape of the problem you are trying to solve? And the second is what are the motion to go through to solve these particular type of problem? A very good um, mental model to understand like this shape pattern motion type of thing I'm talking about is like mountain climbing. For a novice, the mountain looked like one big difficult element to climb. It's just like you have to climb that thing. But when you hear a master of this thing like Alex Arnold talk about the mountain, like it's very clear that it's actually not one thing. It's few big problems that are broken down into a set of movement uh, in between them that like the guy actually drilled multiple times. The big problem are the shapes that you need to recognize in the problem statement and they are very much just like pattern you need to learn about. And sometimes the problems are bigger but they contain like different shapes within them that require different sort of movement. So the motion and the movement that you will need to perform match how the problem gets solved. Now the cool part, once you're done with the first pass, you do another one and you only do the yellow and red. So for these, do study the theory before attempting them again and look at like various examples so to make sure that you got it right. So whenever I study a theory, I put heavy attention on the motion that is going on and I try to find resources that are very heavy on the visualization to supplement it. So again, two blue, one brown, master at that and make complex topic very understandable. There's another one I found uh, for uh, deep learning stuff. I'm going to put it into this description. At this point, I keep track of the yellow and red in the past and rule of thumb, I like to do at least like two passes here uh, when I get a yellow, just so I don't just memorize the, the answer at the end, but I understand the motion. And if I get a deep red, I do like the maximum of five pass, just so that like I can understand the, the theory and the reason why I didn't get it at the at first. After, after five pass, usually like I understand like all problem and all the motions. So if you look here, like you're gonna do the try one, you're gonna do all of these exercises, right? Try two, you're gonna do like a few less, and then like every try that you're gonna do. It's going to be less and less, but only those that like you don't actually understand. And at these, this is where you're going to learn the most, because at some point you're just going to be drilling the stuff that is still uh, unknown to you, how to go from the shape of the problem to uh, the actual motion that you need to do. It's kind of it, folks. Like there's nothing, there's not, not anything more than that. You just drill problem until you get this problem shape pattern recognition and you can start to kind of feel the motion that you need to go through. So just like a gymnast that is able to do a complicated like aerial movement, you'll be able to do calculus, linear algebra, probability, and understand intimately the movement in your own spatial brain. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like if it was the case and leave a comment if you have any question. I'm here to help. Have a great week everyone and see you in the next video.